Hey everyone, this is Kyle with Simulation Lab here in Brooklyn, New York. Um, today we're going to do a crash course on using 3D Studio Max. Um, these are basically just some tips and tricks that, um, that I've come across that, that really help me sort of optimize my, my workflow um, and uh, things that I found really helpful that Max offers. Um, if you're just getting started with 3D Studio Max, um, that's perfectly fine. Uh, there's plenty of really great tutorials out there that, that walk you through every single modifier and, and uh, how to create a, all the parameters of each individual object that you can create and etc. But for this tutorial, we're going to cover some of the basics at the beginning and then uh, maybe slightly more advanced uh, methods uh, near the tail end. Um, so let's get started. Let's jump into Max. So first thing that I always do is customize unit setup. Um, and I want to make sure that the units are um, whatever I want my objects to, to be scaled to, right? So um, I typically select US standard if I'm doing like architectural visualization in my client. Um, the units on their drawings, the units in their CAD files are in uh, imperial units. So I typically choose decimal inches or fractional feet and in inches, right? Um, or you can choose metric if, um, if your client is, you know, using the metric system, right? Of course. Um, or if you don't care, you can choose generic generic units, right? And um, by default, um, one unit equals, you know, like whatever you set it to. So in this case, we're going to be doing one unit equals one inch, and we're going to have you use standard decimal inches, right? So that leads us to the general interface, and this is just assuming that you've at least opened and poked around in 3D Studio Max, um, but we'll cover some of the, just the basic like layout stuff first. Um, so you have four standard viewports, right, that, that Max just opens up with, comes as default. You have your three orthographics, you have your top, your front, your left, and a, just a perspective 3D viewport, right? Um, so in each of these viewports, you see this little plus sign, and I can click on that and I can maximize the viewport, right? But there's also uh, the, the hotkey, the Alt-W hotkey. So if I click on that, Alt-W, and if I hover over any viewport, Alt-W, I can maximize that particular viewport, right? And then there's also, if I right click somewhere in some gray space up here, I know I got a lot of toolbars and we'll cover what all this stuff means just real briefly. Um, but if I choose a viewport layout, layouts tab there, I, this little window pops up and this is, this is pretty helpful. You can have this open if you'd like to switch up your layout every once in a while for, for, you know, for whatever reason. Um, some people like uh, the side by side, so you can have just two um, I can right click and I can delete that if I want. Uh, some people like this layout where there's, you know, three orthographic views on the bottom uh, and then one big perspective up top or whatever. Um, I just like, I like the, the three standard viewports and I, I typically, if I have camera set up on my scene, I'll make this one my camera and the way that you switch uh, what, the, what the viewport is looking like is you can click on this front here and you can choose whatever you want. So if I have a camera set up in my scene under cameras, it'll it'll be here. And you can choose to see through that camera. Okay. Um, so let's uh, let's jump into our perspective viewport, Alt W, right? Um, and let's create an object, right? So in the uh, tab, in this panel here, so I can I can this is the uh, the create panel, right? So I can I can drag this out and create a second column, and then. Um, I have some options here, I have some tabs. So I have a create tab, I got the modify tab, I got a hierarchy tab, I got the motion and display and utilities tab. Okay. So each, each one of these does different things uh, to create and modify objects. Right? So under our create tab, you have your standard geometry, you have shapes like splines and stuff like that, you have lights, you have cameras, helpers, space warps, which is forces and stuff like that. And uh, your like some systems that you can create. So you can create um, uh, biped systems and different uh, cat rigs and bones and stuff like that and whatever, whatever else you want. Pretty helpful. So under our uh, geometry, we also have this little drop down here, which you can choose all kinds of different geometry types you want. So standard primitives, extended primitives, which are slightly more complex shapes compound objects, things like blob mesh and Boolean objects. Boolean objects are like, say if I have a cube and I have a sphere and I wanna take a take the sphere and rip a chunk out of the cube, right? So you can like remove, uh, subtract the cube from the sphere, which we can get into that a little bit. Um, 
but I'm sure uh, if you're familiar with any other 3D software, Boolean operations are pretty standard. So that's where you find those, right? So we can cover how to create a Boolean object shortly. But understand the primitives, uh, box. So if you're really new to 3D Studio Max, uh, some of the, um, uh, the, the, the primitives, uh, the creating some of the primitives can be a little tricky, a little confusing. So we have multiple operations. So in this case, the cube has um, multiple like, click operations that you have to do in order to create a cube, right? So if I click and drag anywhere in the scene, it'll create the base of the cube first. And if I hold, I'm holding down my first uh, little clicker button on my mouse, and I click and drag, right? It's creating the base of the cube. I let go, and it lets me create the height. So I'm just kind of moving my mouse around, not clicking anything. And I move up in the Z direction, and I click, and that creates my cube, right? Um, real quick though, how do I orbit and pan and stuff like that? I got some I got some options down here, but I don't want to click on any of that stuff. And this is really annoying. I mean, I, you could you could click on that. If I click on this little view cube up here, I can click, and I can click around. I can see the front, neat, right? But if you want to be a little more efficient with uh, with viewing things, uh, you hold on your um, you can zoom by scrolling your scroll wheel on your mouse, right? Um, I can pan by holding down the scroll wheel button, right? Pan around, and then I can orbit by holding down Alt on your keyboard. And this is assuming you have a Windows machine, you're holding down Alt, and then, then you click on your middle mouse button, and that orbits, right? So that just makes things a lot more efficient. So you can like look around stuff, you can zoom into stuff, you know, you don't have to like, you know, play around with these cubes or these stupid buttons down here, right? So once you get used to that, just, just practice doing that a little bit. And then we'll take a look at our keyboard real quick. Look down at your keyboard. Q, W, E, R are really important keys, right? These uh, are translation keys by default in Max. Those are your translation hotkeys, right? What I mean by translation is that's your, your select, your move, your rotate, and your scale, right? So if I click on something and I click on Q, I can... I can't really move this, it's not really doing anything. I, I see the X, Y, and Z there, but that's just like selecting things. I, that's just your selector. And if I if I click on other keys or whatever and I have I have Q selected, select object is selected, right? And I can like I can hold down this little guy right here, and that gives me some options for the selector. Right? And I can choose a circle selector. So if I, I can choose a circle and I can choose um, you know, like a, a, a fence select. It's like if you are if you ever play with Illustrator or something, there's like a little fence crop tool. So I can like, uh, that's really helpful if you're uh, trying to select a series of faces. You have like a thousand faces on an object or whatever. And you want to like select only certain faces, you can you can be really precise with that with that tool. Oh, otherwise, there's like the, the spray paint tool, um, which you can like, basically anything that comes in contact with the little spray, spray paint can thing, whoosh, selects that. Yep. So we'll go back to our basic uh, you know, rectangular select tool. Right? W moves. You can see the little move gizmo. You can move in X, Y, and Z, or like you know along the um, X and Y. Um, e is your rotate. You can rotate you know similarly along X, Y, and Z, um, or you can just kind of orbit around if you want to be a little more freeform about it. Uh, and R is your scale, right? And I'm sure if you guys played with 3D Studio Max at all, you'd probably know all this stuff, but um, it's just having those hotkeys like ready to available so you don't have to click up here just makes makes your life a whole lot easier. You don't have to look at it. You know, you just kind of you just kind of intuitively know after a while like where uh, what, what you can do there. Okay, so um, this little drop down here, the reference coordinate system, um, is really helpful too. Um, let's say if I want to if I move this up and I rotate this like that or whatever, you know. Um, if I drop this down, if I go to screen, and no matter, oh, you have to, you know, like if you, depending on what the operation you're using, scale, rotate, or move, you have to change the reference coordinate system each time. Uh, it'll remember what to, what you use. But for screen, um, if I rotate, you can tell uh, the I can move this x and x and y is flat against the screen that you're. However, you're looking at the object, X and Y is flat against the screen, right? 
So if I move the, around the cube, no matter how I move, I can always move this in x and y relative to how I'm looking at it through the screen. Right? So that can be pretty helpful for certain things. Uh, I use local a lot. Local changes the uh, move or rotator scale gizmo based on the uh, relative position of the object itself, the local position of the object. So now it's relative to the object. So I can move this up in the z direction relative to the object. Right? So that's really helpful if you're extruding faces or something and you want it to come away perfectly z, like perfectly up away from the, the object. You know, you're screwing, screwing that face out, you know, or just whatever. I mean, it, it can come in really handy for, for modeling certain things, right? Control C, Control Z works the same way. It is, it's an undo. You can click, click these undo, redo buttons up here if you want. Um, we'll go back to our view coordinate system there. Um, so we'll cover copying real quick. So if I want to duplicate an object, I can right click and clone. And that'll bring up the clone options. You can clone as a copy, instance, or reference. So we'll cover what each of these mean real briefly. So I'll clone this as a copy. Clone this as a copy right in the original location of my previous object, right? You can move it away. And these are two completely individual, independent, unique shapes. Um, and if I want to, uh, sorry, eh, one more thing. You can right click and clone, or you can hold shift and drag along uh, an axis. So I hold shift and drag along the X axis, it creates a clone. And it, the clone, op, clone options dialog box pops up as well. So you can clone as a copy, you can clone as an instance and a reference, right? So I can clone this in as an instance. And I can choose, you know, like say three or four, or like, I can choose however many copies I want uh, of the, you know, of the original object. But if I choose to clone it as an instance, we'll see what happens here. So if I go under the modify tab here, um, I can click on any one of these cubes, right? And if I choose height, I can change the height, but you see, that being that the, these, these three cubes were cloned as an instance from the original cube, um, the instance properties allow me to change all of them simultaneously, right? So that's pretty helpful for certain things. Let's say um, that even works for things like lights. Let's say if I have 100 lights in a, in a scene, um, if I want to instance some of them or all of them, um, I can instance all of them and then I can just change one of them and it'll change the properties for all of them. Right. Pretty helpful. Um, alternatively, I can clone this as a reference. They have a bunch of references, right? So the original object is just stays the same, right? Um, in the reference objects, you can tell that there's a little space above these, right? There's, a little, there's this little blue bar above them, right? And if I click down into the box, I can still modify the box same as an instance, right? But if I go above the blue box and I add a modifier to this one particular object, right, this one cube, um, let's say I'd put an edit poly modifier or something on there, and I drag this up. None of the other boxes change, right? But if I go back to my original object that it's been uh, cloned from, if I go back to the original source, the original cube here, um, I can modify it. And the, the uh, referenced clone will change too, which is really helpful if you just want to like modify one thing in an array of objects, right? So I can go back here and I can like modify this one, I can move this out, I can screw around with that if I want. And I go back to my reference, my original object, I can still modify that, which is pretty cool. And if I want to make any one of these boxes completely unique, right? So I don't want to have any reference uh, parameters retained from the original object. Click on this box and right click and I can convert to editable poly and that'll just completely erase all of the um, original source info. So if I, if I scale these, it'll retain that. Um, otherwise, if I want to, um, you know, if I say, if I create some instances from this one again, um, if I want to make this one completely unique, to where if I change this one, you know, all of these are still changing, right? But if I want to just make this one unique, I can click this little Make Unique button. So that way, if I click on any one of these, they all change besides this one. Right? Oh, and this one too, because I did the same thing. So yeah, pretty simple, uh, pretty simple copy, copying, cloning, reference instances, stuff like that. It'll come in really handy the more you use it.
Okay. Okay, so let's say uh, if I have, let's say, uh, create a couple more copies. And up here, there's some really helpful tools. There's the snaps toggle, which right now uh, my snaps are by default snapping to the grid. So if I right click on this, you get an advanced settings option. So you can tell the grid points are turned on. So if I turn that off and I turn on, let's say, ver vertex, so that'll snap to the vertices of a particular object. So I click on this cube. Uh, you can tell like the little uh, move icon shows up, and I can move this to that to the to this vertex perfectly. Okay? I, I can hold Control and uh, click multiple objects and select multiple, and then hover over the this vertex, and I can move that perfectly. So that works really well. That is super helpful for being really precise with modeling. I say you're modeling a you know a table or a piece of furniture or like a you know an architectural scene, and you want to snap the wall to the floor or something. You can perfectly snap that. So you can be very precise with 3D Studio Maps, which is really helpful. And then, really quick, um, if I turn that off and I turn on this uh, angle snaps, um, I can, you know, if you hit E, you know, your little select and rotate um, changes back to view. Um, I can um, rotate this based on a particular degree. Um, so you can tell, you can see the little degrees uh, pop up there on top of the object. So right now it's at a five degree snap. Um, this is super helpful. Like let's say if I if I rotate this and I go on working on some other stuff in my scene and I, ah shit that's rotated. So I can easily come back in one you know like one of the ortho. You can easily come back in one of the orthographic views and then rotate that, make it perfect again and continue working. So I usually have that stuff on, especially when I'm doing like architectural stuff. That the, the snap, the angle snap, I have it turned on. You can do the percent snap. There's a spinner snap, which we're going to skip those for now. Um, there's the mirror, uh, which that's pretty helpful. Let's say if I have um, created the standard teapot there, I can mirror this teapot by clicking mirror, and it's just going to mirror it. Or I can mirror it as a clone or a copy or a reference, right? Or copy uh, an instance or a reference, sorry. And then I can offset it, offset the clone however much I want. I, Click OK, and then that's just uh, a reference to uh, clone there. So that's, that's pretty pretty helpful. So you can mirror stuff, you can align stuff. Uh, oops. So let's say if I have this uh, teapot selected and I want to align it, let's say if I want to rotate the, the teapot or something, and then I turn on. Uh, one thing I didn't cover yet is um, you can. Uh, this is pretty basic stuff. If you just poke around Max, you'll find this, but. Um, standard shading, this is just shading your viewport with the standard high quality. I, I don't really have any lights or anything set up, so that's not really doing, you know, doing much, but just showing you some basic shadowing information based on whatever lights you got set up in your scene. Default shading, I have that selected. You can do facets. You can choose, uh, you can play with all this stuff. You can do like a clay model. Um, you can override it and choose wireframe. Um, and then Okay, so if you have edge faces selected, that's super helpful if you want to see the individual faces of these objects. Um, so back up to our top menu bar up here, um, I, we're going to cover the align tool. So let's say if I have this teapot selected and I can align it to this box, right? And then I can choose align X, Y, and Z. I can choose to um, rotate it based on the uh, position, X, Y, and Z position of the box. Um, and then I can match the scale too if I want to. But I didn't really scale the objects, so um, we'll go ahead and hit apply. Okay, so that's that's basically aligned it to that to that box. Now let's say I create a few other things, right? Um, before we get into anything else, um, uh, if I want to create a let's say if I want to create another let's say create another teapot, right? And I want to create it on top of this box. No matter how hard I try, we can't really put it on top of that box, right? Um, so Built in is this auto grid tool. So I click on that button. Now I can create a teapot relative to the face of wherever I'm, uh, wherever, uh, wherever I'm choosing on the uh, on a particular object, right? So it'll it'll create a new teapot based on um, uh, wherever I click. So that's super helpful if you want to just make stuff like pretty quickly, right? Cool. So we'll move move along down the the, the line here on the on this uh, top panel. Got your toggle layers. 
Layers are something I use all the time. Um, so you can dock this if you want. I typically have another monitor open and just toss it over there and just have layers open all the time. So layers shows you everything in your scene. You can select stuff here. You can delete stuff. Let's, let's leave just like one teapot. Um, and then you can create new layers with this little button here. So if I want to assign this teapot to a new layer, I can click on it and create a new layer and it automatically assigns it to that layer. And you can double click teapots, right? You can name a layer. Uh, if I want to assign, you know, if I make a duplicate or something, it uh, automatically assigns it to that layer, whatever is, it's, you know, whatever the previous object was on, selected on. If I want to assign this cube to the teapot layer, I have the cube selected and then I can choose this little button here and then it'll automatically assign it to the teapot layer. Right. So that's pretty handy. So I use layers all the time, just basic scene organization, right? You just gotta use it. Um, you have your material editor, which we'll get to later, all your render settings and stuff like that, and I got a few plugins here. So let's jump back into our create panel, all right? So we covered some standard primitives. Uh, maybe we'll do like a real quick, uh, you know, let's say uh, I mentioned Booleans earlier, so um, maybe we'll create a simple little Boolean object here. So I'll move this uh, sphere into the uh, cube there, like this, something. And I want to remove the sphere from the cube, right? So if I click on the cube, I go to extended primitives, uh, sorry, uh, compound objects. With the cube selected, I have this, uh, this list. Uh, these, these are no longer grayed out if I have this selected. So I can go to Pro Boolean or Boolean. Pro Boolean is used if you want to subtract multiple objects from, or if you want to, sub, if you want to Boolean multiple objects from a source object. Um, or you could just use a standard Boolean, which you could just kind of do one at a time. Um, so if I go to, uh, let's say, subtract in the operand parameters list there, and then add operands, click add operands, I can choose my sphere, and then it'll subtract it. Now let's say if I want to subtract it as a copy or something. Compound, I can do Pro Boolean, which gives you a little bit more options. It's not only for subtracting or you know uh, uh, unioning or booleaning, uh, booleaning <laughs> uh, multiple objects. You can also um, yeah, it has a few few other features. You can do um, you can um, choose copy instance reference, right? So if I want to do a copy of the whatever I'm picking, right, whatever operand I'm adding, so I could choose the uh, subtraction operation, and then I can uh, uh, start picking, and I can choose my sphere. And it'll still keep the sphere, but it'll chop it away from the cube, which is pretty cool. And this stuff is anim animation. You can you can you can uh, animate the Boolean operations happening, which we can we can cover that if you guys are interested in that. Let's see if I wanted to have the sphere pass through, and then it kind of just like subtracts it as it's passing through. It looks like it's like eating away at it or eroding the cube or whatever. You can do all kinds of fancy stuff with with that with, with uh, animating. Um, so yeah, that covers uh, some basic compound objects. In your extended primitives, you got you know you got an oil tank, all kinds of different uh, stuff in here. Um, got hedra, hedrons, hedronal shapes, all kinds of stuff. You guys can play around with all these shapes. Um, the really uh, important thing about all of these different shape types is depending on what your end goal is, right? Um, you want to start with the simplest version of whatever you're trying to model, right? And that's just like a, a general um, philosophy of using 3D Studio Max, of, of using polygon modeling, right? Um, or sub-D modeling. Um, so let's say if you wanted to model something like relatively complex, like your hand, right? Modeling your hand, you, you wouldn't just like create an outline or anything like that or, or whatever. You wouldn't create multiple objects. You'd start with like a cube, right? And the cube would represent your palm, right? And then what you would do is you could like subdivide the cube and give it a bunch of faces, and then you can start extruding faces and then create the cube, create uh, like a cubic version of a hand, right? And then later on, you can add more subdivisions and then you can smooth it and then, you know, make it look like a hand. So we'll kind of like practice with that a little bit. So maybe we'll just delete this stuff and we'll start with a brand new scene um, and so we'll create a standard primitive and like so 
this list has a ton of different features and you guys can, if you guys pl have plugins installed, there's all sorts of different um, things that you can create under the uh, geometry tab. Under the shapes tab, splines, you can create a stand, like a, a typical, if you want to do corner by corner, you can create a standard um, just spline that has uh, hard edge um, vertices. You can do smooth, which allows you to create a smooth curve. Stuff like that. You guys can play with all of these. Circle, um, create circles, right? If I want to modify that circle, you have very limited options here. Uh, you can choose to mo uh, modulate the uh, radius of the, the circle. But if I want to like treat it as a spline and do something else with it, I can right click, convert to, convert to editable, edit editable, editable spline. Hard word to say. And then I can, select the individual vertices and I can, you know, tweak them, I can do whatever I want and grab the little corner points there. But pretty cool, right? Um, bunch of other stuff here. I'll let you guys play around with this. We'll continue on. Um, you know, like let's say if you have, you have your lights, you have your cameras, you have your helpers. Um, so maybe we'll cover some of this stuff in a later video. Um, we'll maybe like look at uh, some some ways to to play with a biped character, which is like really super fun to play with. Um, in another video, we might uh, go over um, uh, animating a biped character using BVH or .bip files, which are motion capture files, um, which you can do all kinds of really fun stuff with uh, with the biped. So we'll get rid of this stuff for now. Um, let's cover some basic modifiers. So let's go to our standard primitives and we'll create a box, right? Some kind of box like that, right? And under our modifiers list, you obviously you have like all of your basic parameters. You can, you can uh, create a bunch of length segments, width segments. You can do this if you know exactly, you kind of have an idea of like what you want to do with the, uh, with the box, uh, originally you can um, set up the um, segments in the parameters. Otherwise, you can scroll down here. Um, all of these, there's a there's a ton of different modifiers you can do to this box. Um, so you can just kind of poke around here. You can add all kinds of different modifiers to the stack here. A uh, couple that I use all the time are Edit Poly. So we'll we'll take a look at this first, right? So Edit Poly is super powerful. Um, it allows you to do all kinds of stuff. You can um, select your vertices, right? So I can select individual vertices and move them around. I can stretch this, do whatever I want. Um, I can choose edges and faces. So faces is very powerful, especially if you're modeling things. And if I choose edges, I can select all these edges. And then there's all kinds of different edge edge edit uh, modifiers or um, operations you can do to the to the edges of this object. So I could do is chamfer. Um, which in Max 2018, there's a chamfer modifier, which you can add on top. So we'll do that real quick. So here you can chamfer the edges, right? Uh, I can choose the number of segments I want to make it kind of smooth. I can choose the, uh, sorry, the radius here. Um, and then I can choose to animate this. So I can always go back and edit that through this edit poly modifier, which is pretty helpful. Otherwise, um, if I have these edges selected, um, in the modifier list, you can add multiple modifiers to any object, right? So that's that's called the modifier stack. So the way shapes work in Max is that every shape you can have can retain an inherent history of all the operations that you've done to it in the modifier stack, right? So it's a kind of like a list of operations that you've done, which allow the object to be parametric, right? So that allows you to go back and to change any uh, particular parameter um, from the individual modifiers that you've added to the object, which is super powerful. Okay. So um, let's say if I want to add a chamfer modifier, right? So I can do chan a standard chamfer, I can set the amount, choose a bunch of segments for whatever I want to. Um, and it gives you a bunch of different parameters you can play with. So, and I can always go back to my edit poly and then I can, let's say, um, if I tweak this, pull this out or whatever, 
turn on my edges again, have those edges selected, and you can see the chamfer modifier is still on there, still taking over, right? So we'll go ahead and delete this for now. And you can create multiple edit polys. This is like one really cool thing. Um, say if I select these faces and I connect them because I want to add a few more um, divisions, a few more segments there. Um, and I want to extrude out some of these faces, right? Okay. I can extrude this one inward. Sure. Um, I can add, I can leave this edit poly there and let's say if I'm like a good stopping point, like in case I mess up the model, I can always go back to this, right? Uh, you can go, you can create another edit poly and you can continue working, right? So if I want to create like a, another edge loop there, connect that, sure. Uh, and then if I want to select these vertices and pull them out, do something else, and then be like, oh man, you know what, I really, I really hate this. I, I want to go back. Well, uh, that's easy. So you just right click on that edit poly modifier and delete it and go back to the previous uh, modifier in the stack. Pretty cool. So another thing is like a, another another thing that I use a lot with like modeling organic shapes is if I have, so let's say two, um, and then I can spread these out. You can add a few edge loops and we'll kind of show you what that does. Um, toss an edit poly modifier, uh, sorry, a, a turbo smooth modifier on here. Um, so it kind of smooths it out and I can increase the iterations and make that super smooth. Looks pretty cool. And then if I go back to my, um, I can, I can turn, I can hide this with a little eyeball. And if I double click on the edge loop, I can like drag it up and if I turn on turbo smooth, I still have that selected. So I can like see what that, see kind of how that works. So I can like edit that edge loop. And I can scale it and can do whatever I want, right? So remember when I talked about like modeling a hand, how you would like start with like a cube? That's kind of what we did here. We like started with a cube, we extruded some pieces out, and then you can kind of just like model it, sort of like geometric clay, right? So it's not, it's not like really like free form modeling. You start with primitive objects, like the simplest form of what this is. Like you can you can tell like your finger might be like a a box, right? You can extrude a box out here, extrude it, extrude it a few times, and then, um, you know, add some subdivisions, kind of like what we did here, and then you can, uh, to clean up, you know, to, to like have more control of like where the, uh, uh, the smoothing will um, smooth around the edges, and then toss a smooth, uh, turbo smooth on there, and, you know, it's pretty, pretty simple to model organic shapes. Very simple. Um, Another thing we can add here is like a, a noise modifier. So uh, let's let's create like a sphere. Show you what this does real quick. Um, and we'll keep the way keep keep the uh, parameters where they're at. And noise modifier is something I use a lot. Just I kind of use it all the time. It's it's super simple to get something like weird looking. If you want want like I have like a modulating like cube or sphere or whatever. Um, you want it's uh, it's really helpful to like just be able to do that. So and you can animate the animate the noise over time. So if you scrub your timeline down here, whoa. So um, the noise modifier is, is really powerful for um, creating surface uh, variation. Um, let's say, for instance, if you want to create. Um, Something that's part of a simulation, let's say if I want to have particles like run and like stick to this and make them look like they're sort of flocking or like morphing or something, then I'd, I'd use something like that. Otherwise, I mean, I'm sure you guys can come up with like a thousand other like things that you would use uh, the noise modifier for. Super powerful. So let's go ahead and we'll just clear out our scene. We'll get rid of everything. And we'll create another just box real quick. And we'll cover what's underneath the hierarchy tab. There's all kinds of cool stuff here. You can adjust the pivot. Um, let's say, uh, this is really helpful. I, I use this all the time. Let's say um, if I if I do put like an edit poly modifier on here or something, drag out this face just real quick. Um, the pivot for this object stays in the original location of where it was, where it was created when the object was created. So in this case, it was like in the center of the box. And then I extruded this face out 
but the pivot is still over there. You know, so if I rotate this, it's rotating it based around the um, pivot of you know the original location. Like, what if I want to modify that? What if I wanted to rotate around the center of this box now it's created? Well, under the hierarchy tab, you can affect pivot only, and then you can center to object, or you can move the pivot wherever you want to. Let's say if I want to put it out here, okay, and I want to rotate it around that particular location. Cool. Um, affect pivot only, center to object, and then you can rotate it. You can do whatever you want with the pivot, but Let's say if I want to keep it there, you have to like you have to un unclick that. Remember, right? And then now you can pivot around the center. Super helpful. Um, you can edit the working pivot, which we won't go into any more of this stuff. You guys can play around with this, but that's just super easy. Um, just one thing that you're gonna have to use eventually. So just remember that it's under the hierarchy tab. So under the motion tab, we'll we'll cover some of the stuff that's in here with the controllers and motion once we um, jump into some basic animation. Um, so we'll do that in a second here. Um, display tab, if you have a bunch of stuff displayed, so if you have a, bot, I have a bunch of geometry, you got some, uh, got some lights, right? You got a target light, sure, whatever. You know, um, and cameras. Got some cameras, lights, and all kinds of stuff in my scene. If I want to see just geometry, um, I can uncheck all and just choose geometry or whatever, um, and then I can check none. If I don't want to see the cameras, I can click cameras, right? So this is super helpful, especially when you're dealing with characters that have bones, and at render time, you don't want to render the bones, and it's kind of a pain in the ass to like select the bones and then you know right-click and make them not renderable or whatever. Um, easiest way to do that is just under the display tab, you could just like uncheck bone objects, right? Uh, or you could check check the bone objects and it won't appear in your scene. Super easy. Right? Um, and that also helps like if you're cruising through your scene and you're like modeling stuff and you just like don't you have a bunch of cameras everywhere and you just like don't want to see cameras or lights or anything at the current moment, you could just like hide that stuff and you just like focus up on your on your um, on your objects, right? Or whatever you want. Um, another way to do it is if you're really organized and you like set up your scene with layers. Um, you can assign lights to layers, you can assign geometry to layers, like whatever to the particular layers, and then you can like turn those layers off and on. You can work like that. It just kind of depends on your preference. Again, there's like a hundred ways of doing things in 3D Studio Max, but hey, you know, it's, a, it's up to you, like however you want to work. Okay, and then so in, under utilities, there are all kinds of utilities. You can add a bunch of, you know, like quick little tools to like help you do certain things, you know. You can like camera match stuff. There's a camera tracker built in. Um, if you have a bunch of different objects, you can collapse them into one object, right? Which we didn't really cover that. Um, if you want to make like real quick, um, you know, a couple ways of doing this. If, uh, if I want to make this one object, right? There's a couple ways of doing it. I can collapse it with a collapse uh, utility, collapse selected. And that's just going to create one object. So like no matter what I do, it's going to retain, it's going to, um, if I have multiple materials, it's going to ask me if I want to merge materials into a multi-subobject material, which we'll cover later. Um, but it, you can choose to like just collapse into a, a single object, multiple object, whatever you want. Right? Pretty helpful little utility. Um, another way of doing it is if you have multiple objects created in your scene. Um, instead, if I don't want to boolean these together. If I want to, like, let's say, use them in a simulation or something, um, I can select one. I can add an edit poly modifier onto it, and then I can attach um, elements. Right? I can attach elements by a list, or I can just like attach that. So now it's part of that uh, object, and I can, you know, now I can like select multiple faces and drag them out. I can do whatever I want with those, you know. Um, so pretty helpful. So let's cover some basic animation stuff real quick. So just to get you guys started, um, down here is your animation timeline. Obviously, there's no keyframes. There's nothing happening. So there's we scrub this uh, little timeline uh, here. There's nothing that happens, right? Um, so first things first, like typically when you create an animation, uh, you want to go under your time configuration settings here, which is this little uh, clock down there, this little button. I don't know why the button's so small, whatever. 
um, you could choose your frames per second um, FPS, which is like typically standard film is like 24 or 30 frames per second. All the animations I make are typically 30. If you want to do something crazy, you want to do 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second or whatever, um, you can do that as well. And then you can do like some slow mo stuff in post, whatever you want to do. Um, you can choose your your playback speed. I typically choose to have real time selected um, and frame count. We can set our frame count to 300. And you can do some simple math on that. Like, say I want to make a 10 second animation, right? At 30 frames per second, um, that's 300 frames. So I set my frame count to 300, you know. Um, yeah. So if I click on the play button, it's automatically going to play the animation. And I can grab it and I can scrub it. Um, let's, uh, so let's animate this uh, sphere moving uh, or something. If I click on auto key, there's a couple ways of doing this, right? I can click on auto key and then I can click, I can drag somewhere in my timeline and like just keep it in your head. Like, you know, you'll get used to it after a while, like animating stuff, but 30, fr 30 frames is one second, right? So it's like one 1,000, right? Uh, 60 frames is two seconds, right? So if I move this, it's going to take two seconds to get up there, right? So if I, if I have auto key selected, you can see the this bar above the timeline is red. And from zero to 60, there's two keyframes that are automatically generated. So it's gonna move up there, right? But so let's say like halfway, like one second, I want it to like kind of like move up uh, that way, right? I could like just move it there and it's gonna automatically create a keyframe there. So, and then I can always like select that keyframe and delete it if I don't want it. And then I can always drag these keyframes around. Let's say if I want, instead of 60 frames, I want it to happen in 30 frames. It'd take a second to get up there. Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, so that's like some basic, that's like how you basically animate something, right? So then I can like drag it here. I can drag it here, right? Drag this around. Cool. That's how you do that. Right? Now let's say I want to, let's say I want to animate this along a path, right? Something um, pretty simple, right? Um, I can go ahead and delete all these keyframes. We don't need them. Um, and then let's just go up to our top orthographic view here. And then under our shapes, um, let's create a line. Smooth, smooth, and we'll go ahead and like create a loopy racetrack here for our, for our smear. And then if I click on the first uh, vertice, vertex here, it uh, asks me to close line. Yes, sure. Um, go back to perspective, and so kind of we could do whatever you want with the with the spline. But if I have the sphere selected, let's maybe make this a little smaller, just you, just, you can see it. Uh, under the motion tab, um, under this first little drop down here, assign controller. And there's a couple ways of doing this, but this is just the kind of the longer way to do it. But it's it's like showing you guys step by step like how you how you would do it and have full control over this thing, right? So that's the point is having full control over this, right? There's a there's a million ways to do, to do certain things, but this is probably the most like you know comprehensive way. So. Um, under the assign controller drop down here, if I choose, you can choose whatever I want here. I can choose position, right? And if I click on this little check box, it says assign controller. Um, I can choose a path constraint, right? Choose path constraint. And then it's, it gives a little dialog here. I can choose add path and then I can choose the path and it's automatically going to snap to the path. And then if I scrub my timeline, you can see there's two keyframes set up one all at the beginning, one all at the end. If I scrub my timeline, it's going to go 100% all the way, depending on the length of my timeline. So it's going to take just 300 frames. It's going to take 10 seconds to get from the starting position, which kind of just randomly chose wherever the starting position was, uh, all the way to the end. Now, if I want to have that, I can always like drag this, and I can always like you know change it to like 120 frames, and then whoa, cool, it got all the way there. Or I could change this if I want to have it like three revolutions all the way around the track, right? I think this is pretty self-explanatory, but uh, if I choose auto key and percentage along path, I can always animate that. Let's say I want it to be 200. So it's going to do two um, 
revolutions around the path, right? So you see what that does there? Yeah. Let's get to 120, it stops. Uh, and let's say if I wanted to go backwards after 120 or something, you know, I could always go uh, along the path, I can go negative 100. So that way it's going to go, it's going to go do two revolutions around the path, right? And then once it gets to the starting point at 120, it's going to go backwards really fast, apparently. Um, so that's one thing that's pretty cool. Um, another thing we could do is, um, let's say uh, we still have full control over this, right? Um, let's get rid of that. Change this back to 100. And I'll show you what this other options do here. So let's say there's some curves in our path, right? And you can always like smooth this out if you want to under your modified tab. You got interpolation. You can increase the step size, and you can you can kind of tell that the more I increase that step size, the smoother the spline gets. I don't know if you can really see that in the monitor, but you can play with that. Um, click back on our little disc here. Now that we have that back in our motion tab. Um, with our path, path constraints still enabled, right? I could choose follow, and it's going to follow. Um, I can, you kind of can't really tell what it's doing there, but um, you can tell when it goes around uh, a corner, it moves. It's, it's a little bit more obvious when I click on bank, right? It goes around a corner, it banks around the corner, which, which is really cool if you want to do stuff like, you know, if you want to animate a fighter jet or, you know, a bird or something that, like, you know, follows a path, but it also wants to bank around stuff because that's what it naturally does, right? A, a bird doesn't fly like this, you know? So, um, I could bank around stuff. I could choose to loop it forever, um, you know. So there's a bunch of stuff you could do with the path constraint. Um, so that's just, like, one, one method of animating stuff. There's a, again, there's a million other methods. Let's choose, like, one other thing. Um, to uh, animate. It's just like one tip that was sort of hard to meet for me to grasp was animating visibility. Like how do you make something just disappear for a certain amount of time and then come back? Or like, let's say if I want to have something like the scale to like pop into existence, right? I want to like, but after a certain amount of time or something. If I click on our, if I right click, there's a couple ways you can bring this up, but the easiest way is like, if you take any object, select, have any object selected, Right click and you can bring up the dope sheet, right? Um, and let's see here. Objects in your sphere. You got to drag this up a little bit so you can see. Um, there you go. So uh, I have my object here selected in the dope sheet for, the, for this object. And um, you can drag this down. You can see the transform. You can do all kinds of stuff here, but we're going to add a visibility track, right? So with this uh, object selected, if you go to um, view, uh, sorry, edit, visibility track, you can add it to the sphere. Right? So if I drop down, you see the transform track, you have visibility track too, now add it, right? And by default, the visibility is set to one, right? So anything between zero and one is visible or not visible, right? Zero is completely invisible, one is visible, right? So we can animate this. Uh, by adding a couple keys, right? So let's say at um, frame zero, right click. So let's say frame, okay, sorry. Um, add or remove key, you can click on this button right there. And you can like click on it uh, on the little timeline that's represented here in the dope sheet anywhere you want. And you can right click and um, add a value of zero, right? So that'll make it completely invisible. And we're going to keep our in and out here as curves because we want it to kind of like gradually like pop in. Um, otherwise, you can, uh, I don't know, you can play around with these and see like well, however you want the visibility to animate in, right? Those are really helpful. Curves are really helpful in the curve editor, which you can look at in a different video or later or whatever. Um, curves are really helpful to animate like the smoothness of things happening. Like, do you remember when we animated the sphere moving? And we like position it this way and this way, right? So like, if you wanted to have it like jagged, like it stops here and then moves here, right? You can have that, or you can use a cur the curve editor. You can have it nice and smoothly, gradually animate, um, you know, from uh, one position to the next. So that's what's really helpful. So 
uh, for our visibility settings, click that, it will uh, we'll set this to zero, right? So at frame zero, it'll be invisible. And at frame 30, let's say we'll, we can uh, drag this to frame 30, or you can even do it here, doesn't matter. At frame 30, uh, you can tell it's already invisible, right? But we'll, just, we'll take a look at that again in a second. Um, click back on our little add uh, key tool there. And click on, on frame 30. We'll click another, uh, make another keyframe there. Right click on the keyframe, and we'll set this to 1. That's it. And there's all kinds of different settings that you can, you can play with. Um, so that's, that's basically it. So our object animates from 0 to 1, visible to invisible. Invisible to visible. <laughs> so we're done with the dope shoe. We can close that. Um, so now if I turn off edge faces, right, so you can't see the model anymore. You know, now it appears. Boom. So that affects the visibility of the shader of the sphere. So that's it for like basically getting you guys started um, with modeling stuff, um, adding modifiers to the modifier stack for particular objects, right? Um, animating like basic animation using the hierarchy of particular objects, like changing the changing the pivot in the hierarchy. Um, We've covered some of the stuff in the motion tab, adding path constraints and stuff like that. We covered the display tab, um, covered a couple basic utilities that you can use, and a bunch of and a bunch of the tools up here, right? So in the next video, we're going to cover some um, rendering settings and setting up cameras and lights and stuff like that, and maybe covering. I think we'll probably stick with uh, one uh, render engine for now. Maybe we'll do a, a, another one. I have a couple engines that we can cover, like V-Ray and F-Storm and Octane. Um, I'm sure if you're in the community, you've probably heard those words before. You've probably heard different rendering engines before. And the, like, what do they do and why, why are they different? So we'll cover some of that stuff. Um, again, this was just a, a basic crash course on like getting into 3ds Max and like the basic tools that we have. We've done a couple um, relatively complex exercises, like you know, animating, thing, animating things along a path, and how to you know how to use uh, different modifiers and stuff like that. But ultimately, the goal of this video was to just get you up to speed on like how to make stuff, right? How to just generally just make stuff in Max and how to use the interface. Right. So if there's anything else that you guys are confused about, if there's anything uh, that you want to like dive deeper into, um, want to learn a little bit more about the different modifiers or something, let me know in the comments section below. Um, and we can, I can create a, uh, maybe a separate uh, tutorial, tutorial or a series of tutorials to cover some of those things. Um, as always, if you guys like this video, if you found it useful or helpful, uh, please like and subscribe to the channel. I have a bunch of other tutorials that I've made, um, and I'm going to continue to make more. Um, so if you guys find it helpful or useful, again, um, please feel free to, uh, to like the video and uh, leave a comment in the section below for the algorithm gods. Great, thank you so much for watching and uh, we'll see you soon.